with me turning to Jeremiah 17 again and uh, we'll probably be in uh, Luke 6 again my goodness tell me what page number Jeremiah's on somebody <laughs> apparently it's before all that <laughs> what 1026 all right we'll see what that works by golly <laughs> okay Jeremiah yeah, Jeremiah 17, and then we put a marker over here in Luke 6. Alan Taylor has been uh, teaching us about our lives and really our ministry being more like trees than they are. You know, Jesus would use different things in his parables and in his teaching. Uh, you know, if he uses a lily, there's a reason for using a lily. You know, lily is very beautiful. It grows very fast. But it has a very short season. And then, you know, you, once the bloom is gone, you gather it up. And let, a woman might use it to make, you know, a, as fuel in her oven to bake bread with, you know. And so Jesus had a reason for that. But if he keeps talking about us, like being like trees, you know, trees take a whole lot longer to develop. And especially uh, fruit trees. And we talked about this last week that... Uh, you know, we're really fruit trees. Jesus says in Luke 6, you know, by their fruit, you'll know them. And uh, so we'll get into more of that as we go along here. Let me put a marker myself here, Luke 6. Okay. And uh, also, we're going to be in Psalms 1. So starting here in uh, Jeremiah, says, uh, starting in verse 5, it says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusts in man and makes flesh his arm. And whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath. And that uh, King James word, it just means a shrub. If you've ever driven across the desert, you know, it's got a lot of little scrub brush about up to your knee. It'll be like a scrub, scrub brush in the desert. And shall not see when good cometh. But shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a what? Okay, he shall be as a tree planted by the waters that spreads out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat comes, but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought. Neither, now notice, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Now, quickly, I'm going to review just a little bit. I want pictures in your mind. When I used to drive those trucks across the Mojave Desert for years, I remember the first time I ever drove across the Mojave, I'd never really seen it before. And, and boy, it's a real desert. Now, I mean, it goes for just hundreds of miles and, and uh, flat, most of it, and there's mountains here and there, but just rocks and sand and little, little heaths, <laughs> little scrub brushes here and there. And I was driving along, and, and then off in the distance, I, I could suddenly see what looked like green from horizon to horizon in front of me. I thought, well, maybe I'm coming to the end of the desert. I thought maybe it was a, a forest, you know, or something. And, but then as I got closer, and there is enough little rise, you get a little rise every now and then, and I, 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 could, see, I could see desert beyond that green. And so the, more, the closer I got to it, I, I could tell it's, no, it's like a ribbon of green through the desert. Well, finally, you get right to it, and you'll go across a little bridge, and, you know, you can look right and look left as you go across, and it, it's a stream in the desert. It's a little, it's a little, uh, might be a real small one, but it's a river or a stream of some kind. Some, it might even just be a wash where, when it does rain, you know. The, but looking either way, you know, looking on the right or the left, what that green is, those are trees. And they'd be relatively tall. They might be, you know, some of them 10, 15, 20 foot tall. And it's exactly the illustration of this verse. And I thought, man, you can look in all directions. There's nothing but devastation. There's no, there's no rain. There's nothing can grow hardly here at all. There's nothing that produces fruit. There's not a fruit-bearing thing anywhere out there. But these trees that are planted by the rivers of water, they're receiving nourishment from an unseen source. <laughs> that provides for them no matter whether it rains or whether it doesn't rain. Now, when it rains, they receive benefit from the rain like everybody else. But when it doesn't rain, they still flourish because they 
planted by the rivers of water. They're, they're drawing nutrients, they're drawing nourishment and, and uh, moisture up through the root system in, into the tree. Well, Jeremiah says, well, how do you get that to happen in your life with God? Well, the way Jeremiah phrases it, he said, blessed, verse 7, blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. I'm going to postulate that it's really hard to trust in the Lord if you don't know the Lord. And I'm going to say again, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Uh, you can't really trust the Lord beyond your knowledge of what he has promised. That's what faith is. Somebody asked me the other day, said, well, John the Baptist was born. He was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. That's what it says. He says, can I have faith for that, that my baby will be born filled with the Spirit from, they were, you know, expecting a baby from my wife's womb? I said, sure you can. Just show me the chapter and verse where that promise is. <laughs> well, there is no verse like that. I mean, there was a reason that John the Baptist was, there was a, he had a, there was a reason for that. But there is no promise in the word for you that, you know, that you can stand on for that. Now, we have lots of promises. So, the key, according to Jeremiah, don't trust in man, trust in the Lord. Well, let's go to Psalms 1. Psalms 1 tells you the beginning phases of how you do that. So it's back this way, isn't it? Psalms chapter 1. Hallelujah. It's another one of those where I... Okay. Psalms chapter 1 says, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. Now remember, under that covenant, they only had the law. They didn't have the entire word of God like we do. How would you apply that in our, in our covenant? His delight is in the word of God. His delight is in the word, especially the word that has to do with your covenant. They, they were to delight in the word that had to do with their covenant. So I'm going to read it like this. His delight is in the word of God, and in his word does he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree. Now, here we go again. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but they are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Now, Jeremiah said, cursed is the man that trusts in man. Well, what he's talking about is verse 1 here, see. You don't want to be the guy who takes his counsel from the world, the ungodly, or stands in the way of sinners. You don't want to. You don't want to walk in the way of sinners. You don't want to sit in the seat of the scornful. That's that's taking your counsel from the world. And really, though, if you don't know God's word, you can be a really born again Christian and be saved and love Jesus. I, I know some of these. I mean, I've known them. I'm not a novice at this. I mean, they really love God now. They're and spirit filled and. Run when the music plays and shout and hallelujah. Don't know the word of God. Easy to deceive. First ones to cry and squall and bawl every time trouble comes. And it's not that they don't love God. It's that they don't meditate the word. See, he says, blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord. We, you trust in him in direct proportion to your knowledge of his word. God and his word are one. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God and His Word are one. So, I remember in the early days hearing Dave teach about this. You know, he says, now, uh, at first, at first level of instruction was learning how to meditate the Word of God in whole images. How many of y'all were here for that, you know? He has a big set of tapes out there, and now, of course, it's online called Meditation, imagery, and delivery. And uh, I, I mean, that was the first set of tapes that Sue and I got. It's a big set. I think it had nine lessons in it. Oh, my God. I was listening to that set of tapes. My Lord, 
I was, how many, I see some kindred souls back here. I, I said, that, that's it. Yeah, he, he broke some difficult verses that, that my whole life I had been taught wrongly about, you know. I totally believed them wrong. And he, so the first law of meditation is you don't ever, and that means not ever, and that means not at any time, and that means for no reason, and that means not ever at all. Do you lift a verse out of its setting to try and understand what it means? And he said, when Jesus would teach, I mean, bless Dave's heart, he meticulously taught us this, you know. He says, Jesus is the master teacher, and he's, 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 he's painting a picture of revelation for you, and every word and every verse is a stroke of the brush, but you've got to have the entire teaching in order to understand the image that, that he's giving you. That's real good, isn't it? I have, a, I have a teaching based on that that I call the eyelash of a cow. Let's say, let's say the Lord sent you to some little island somewhere where they've never had cows in their life. And you're trying to explain to them what a cow is. They say, a cow? What is a cow? We don't have cows. You say, oh, well, you're in luck. I happen to have with me the eyelash of a cow. <laughs> Here, you can just study this. And just by studying this eyelash, you should be able to discern what an entire cow looks like. <laughs> Well, that's exactly what we do when we take a verse out of its setting and trying to understand the mind of Christ and the heart of God based on one single verse. It's like trying to understand what a cow is from an eyelash. It won't work. Well, boy, that, that, man, that set me on a journey. And just like Dave says, the first level of understanding this, you you, you come to passages and you say, difficult, difficult passages. And you say, Lord, Holy Spirit, help me back up. Where does this subject begin? And then help me go past that verse. Where, where does Jesus or whoever, whatever passage it is, where do they quit talking about this and move on to the next thing? Because by doing that, then you can meditate that, that passage of Scripture in the whole image with every stroke of the brush being complete. Y'all have heard me teach many times, which I'm not going to get into tonight. Based on that teaching, then like, for example, one real good one that I found out one image that you might want to meditate is Luke 15.1 through Luke 17.10. Now, you don't need to look at it tonight, but you might write that down. That is all one image. And boy, there is a ton of things in there. The unjust steward is in there. The prodigal son is in there. The lost coins, the lost sheep, the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, Lord, increase our faith. And if you can say to this mountain and... and um, you know, the, the, the servant, and we are, in, just say we're unprofitable servants. All of that is included in there. And you'll never get it. I'm just telling you now, you'll never really understand it unless you, unless you meditate that as one single image. It is all one teaching. Well, there's a lot of others like that that I found. That really helped. Man, it's Luke 6. I mean, we go to uh, Luke 6 all the time. Let's go there for a minute. That'll be a good illustration. Luke chapter 6. Now, the, the, the eyelash of the cow <laughs> for most of the church regarding Luke 6 is verse 38. That's the only thing you ever get out of Luke 6 at most churches. It's all I ever got for years. And they gave it at offering time. Here's the eyelash of the cow. You ought to be able to understand God's financial system from this one verse. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Shall men give into your bosom, for with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. And they just lift that verse out and teach on it. And they'd use other verses from other places in the Bible to su- supposedly support their doctrine. And you all probably never heard this, but I heard it a lot. And they said, see, it all depends on how much you give when the offering time comes. And you go to church and it's time for the offering. And he says, now, what do you want? Do you want little bitty blessings from God? Do you want big blessings from God? And notice, with the same measure that you meet, it's measured back to you again. So if you want God to just bless you with little teaspoons of blessing, when the offering plate comes, just put in a little teaspoon offering, and that's what you'll get back from God. But now if you'd like a carload of blessings from God, all you have to do, you know, give a little bigger, you give a carload, and he gives back in carloads. But boy, if you want those dump truck blessings where God backs up to your house, and I mean, you know, it's a dump truck of God, and he comes and he backs up. and I mean, this dump truck just dumps out blessings upon you. You're going to have to give 
big. You got to give truckloads. Some of you are going to have to maximize your credit cards. Or some of you are going to have to buy a wallet that will never go empty. I, <laughs> I fell for that stuff in those days. I fell for it because I was, it was the eyelash of a cow. I didn't know any better. I was just listening to them lift verses out of their setting. Now see, the reason this is so important, why it falls exactly within the parameters of this lesson tonight, look at verse 43. For a good tree bringeth, bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, Neither does a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. He's talking about the very thing we're talking about tonight. He's talking about our lives and our ministry. He says, Every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather fig, figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man, now notice, out of the good treasure of his heart. Hmm, wonder where you would get that. Come back to that in a minute. Out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth that which is evil. For the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. Now notice, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart. How did he get that treasure? I wonder if it would help if a man was to meditate in the word of God day and night. Day and night. Day and night. I wonder if you filled, your, filled yourself with the word of God, meditate day and night, lay it up like treasure, lay it up on the inside of you. See it, and th then Dave began talking to us. Boy, I'm gonna stay on meditation. I'm about to jump into assimilation. Okay, hang on. Now, see, talking about trees, this is the very subject we're on. Dave would take us right down to verse 46. He says, "Now let's let's meditate in a whole image here for a minute. This is all red letters. If you got a red letter, red letter Bible, this whole thing here, this." It's a big, long teaching that they, all, they always lift just one verse out of. So verse 46, he says, Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever comes to me and hears my sayings and doeth them, I'll show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth. And against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. And Dave would say, now, Jesus is plainly saying to both men, the storms of life come. You need to know the storms of life are going to come to all, you know. How many of you want your house to stand? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. How many of you want your house to fall? No, no, no. He says, well, look at it. He says, the key... The guy whose house stood is verse 47. Whosoever comes to me, hears my sayings, and doeth them. He's the one that has, the storm beat on his house all right, but his house didn't fall. And he says, so the key is to find his sayings and do them. Maybe we could find some of his sayings, Dave would say. They said, you probably wouldn't have to back up very far. Find his sayings. Find his sayings. Ah, oh, maybe verse 27 where it says, but I say. <laughs> but I say unto you, wouldn't that be one of the Lord's sayings? Maybe we're about to see some of his sayings. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies. What? Do good to them which hate you. What? Bless them that curse you. And pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him. And he goes on and on with this. And what you find out that God's really talking about, Luke 6, 38 has absolutely nothing to do with a church offering at all. Never, never has, never will, won't in the future. It has everything to do with do you have the heart of God towards that sinner or not. See, the treasure of heaven is people. This whole gospel is about seeking and saving that which is lost. That's what's precious to the Father. He's trying to find people who have filled their hearts with God's word and prayed in the, in the Spirit, to be honest with you, enough to where the heart of God begins being manifest in your heart. And when that happens, you're going to start loving ugly people. You're going to start wanting to save sinners. Your heart of compassion is going to... You're going to, love, you're going to have more affection for that ugly sinner than you have for the 50,000 he's stealing from you. Now that takes a work of God, I'm telling you right now. <laughs> it takes a work of God. That's really what he's talking about. And when he talks about the fruit on the tree, it's in this context. Is your fruit 
the same. See, that's the heart of God that runs in that river that you're planted by. We'll see what kind of fruit is on your tree. If there's never any love for the sinner. You know, the Bible even says you should love your brethren. <laughs> we could start there. <laughs> First, you've got to love saved folks. <laughs> But then, eventually, you've got to start loving unsaved folks. And if you're drawing into you from that river, which is God, that kind of fruit eventually will start showing up on your tree. Paul wrote in one of the letters to the Corinthians, he says, why, why do you go to court one against another, believer against believer? He says, why don't you just rather be defrauded, suffer wrong? And I didn't know for years why. I just knew he didn't. <laughs> then one day, now, oh yes sir, now we're into assimilation. See, I didn't know for years and I never would have understood it. I wish I knew exactly where that was. Y'all know that verse is in the Bible, right? He says, now why don't you just rather suffer wrong? And I didn't know. Assimilation is what gave the answer on that. Assimilation. So let's talk about assent let some Michael, you're charged with reminding me to talk about why, why don't we? rather suffer wrong. Don't let me forget to come back to that, please. Well then, so Dave taught us on that. Is that enough on, on meditation? Learn to ask the Holy Spirit to help you find the beginning and the ending of subjects. Then meditate it. That means read it again, the whole image, again and again and again. Pray in other tongues. If you don't know what a word means, it's okay to go look it up, but for God's sake, don't read the commentaries. Okay? You'll get everything, everything in the world. Okay? Holy Ghost is your commentator. All right? Well, then Dave started teaching another level beyond that, and that's called assimilation. And even as I begin this, we've actually had people leave the message or leave the fellowship of the prayer center. Let's say it that way. Because they're going, I can't find where anywhere we're required to do assimilation in order to be saved. Honey, we're not teaching things at this church that you need to do in order to be saved. We're trying to give you tools for the hungry. You know, if, if, if you want more of God, if you want more of fruit when you pray, if you want, if you want to really fulfill the, the, the highest and best, what we're offering you is tools. No, you, nowhere does it say you have to assimilate the Word of God. But if you're hungry and you want more, it's a really effective tool. I'm going to give you a help here tonight. I hope I have enough. I may not. We'll Xerox some more if we need to. Well, anyway... So then they began teaching about assimilation. And you all know, now assimilation is where you, you begin reading all the books. We recommend you start in the New Testament. That's where your covenant. And you read Matthew. Maybe you read it ten times. He says, to really do it right, you need to read every book in the New Testament a minimum of 30 times. While you're reading it, you're not necessarily trying to get revelation knowledge out of it. You're equipping yourself for day and night meditation. See, your spirit doesn't really ever sleep. Even while you're asleep, your soul, have you noticed it dreams? It, it interacts with your spirit. You can have, I've had pizza dreams. I've had God dreams. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and what you're doing when you're assimilating the word of God, you're equipping yourself for day and night meditation. I've had some of my best revelations. I mean, the first thing when my eyes open in the morning, where my, my soul is still pretty much quiet, and it's been, I've been meditating all night long, and all of a sudden it's like the, the voice of, of the Holy Spirit is just waiting for me to wake up, and man, there comes a revelation, just boom, you know. So assimilating, Dave uses the analogy like this, you know. He said he once tried to learn Portuguese because he goes down to uh, Brazil a lot, and that's what they speak there. So, you know, you get one of those... Uh, probably a cassette when he first started doing it, you know, and it says a word, and then you repeat it. Like, what's the word he used? Or, or, abrigato. Is that it? Abrigato. What does that mean? Thank you. Thank you. Abrigato. Thank you. Abrigato. Or whatever it means. Anyway, so he'd learn like four or five words, you know, and he's, he'd be so ready for the next trip. He'd, he'd maybe learn a whole sentence. He'd go down there and he'd try and say it. Obrigato, or whatever else he said. They'd, they'd just start... <laughs> You know, they could tell he's, he's just a parrot mouthing the sounds. He really does not know the language at all. 
He says, but you know what? He says, you could take a little child that's three or four years old, move to, now he always says, parachute them in, that'd be okay. <laughs> I don't know about parachuting in a four-year-old child, but anyway, he says, well, even us, he says, you, you know, you could parachute in. You could parachute in. And he says, all of a sudden, you don't have just one of your senses, the mind, trying to understand this. Everything about you, your ear gate, your, uh, uh, all of your senses now are assimilating that whole culture, not just the words, but everything, all that goes along with those words, you know. So uh, he says, you could take a little child. It wouldn't be very long. You could just, you just put them there, and it won't be very long. They'll be speaking Portuguese. And they didn't ever set out to learn it. They did it by assimilation. He says, I can tell you how to parachute into the book of John, into the book of First Timothy, into the book of Romans, where y you can assimilate the revelation knowledge of God. You know, Dave's really good. I'm, I'm summarizing everything quickly. So what he was talking about was began reading all the books of the New Testament at least 30 times. Well, uh, I don't want to hand it. If I hand this out yet, you'll quit listening. <laughs> I began to do that. Uh, it took me two and a half years. I'm not, I'm not a real fast reader. Uh, it took me two and a half years, and I, and I didn't do it all the time, but uh, I stayed pretty steady at it. Now, the way I did it, I didn't have this. I'm going to give you a little form that's going to help you. I didn't have that in the beginning. I, I had uh, uh, just a sheet of paper that I ruled with a ruler myself and made boxes, and I listed all the books of the New Testament. And every time I'd read one, I'd put an X. I also had... And it was just the ugly building days. I, I had two little jars there and had 30 beans in it. And every time I'd read a book 30 times, or, or I'd read it, I'd move a bean from the bean jar to the empty jar, you know. And like, well, I got a, some people tell me that they, right on the first page of like the book of Matthew, they'll put a little hash mark every time they read it. I think that's even better. And that way you've got it with you in your Bible, you know. But the idea is so you'll have some record of it. See, good intention. Okay, here I go again. Good intentions don't count for squat. Just, you know, good intentions are the highway to hell. I'll just be honest with you. Just, you know, neutralized by good intentions. Uh, if you don't, people ask me all the time, do you plan your prayer life? Yeah, I'm not as good at it now as I used to be. I need to be. I need to get back to that. See, because I'm just like you. If I don't plan it, something always crowds it out. And it's, all, it's usually good stuff, you know. It's not bad stuff. It's good stuff, you know. Ministry, whatever, you know. But if you, if, you know, we do plan things that are really important in life. <laughs> we got the, the Mark and Deborah's daughter just got married. They never did really set a date, right? They just got around to it one day. Is that the way you get, is that the way you do weddings? No. Yeah, about a year in advance. You schedule that thing. You start preparing for that thing. See, uh, like if, if you were really hurting, you know, say you had a, ter a, a bad toothache, bad, one of those where it's swollen like a golf ball on your, man, you ever had one of those? I hope you haven't. Man, they hurt like the dickens, you know. And you call. You, know, you want, you're hurting in the morning and you want to see the dentist that afternoon. And the earliest they can get you in is two weeks, three o'clock in the afternoon on a Tuesday. I don't care. If you have to move the golf game and, you know, whatever else, the bridge club and whatever it else was that you had scheduled, you are going to see the dentist at 3 o'clock that Tuesday afternoon. Why? Well, you know, he can help you. Well, honey, if he can help you, how much can the Holy Ghost help you? When you're spending that time with him, you have got a, 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 a scheduled appointment with the one who can help you more than anybody else anywhere. God, the Holy Ghost himself. And those times are important, and if we don't schedule it, it won't happen. Well, I found out the same thing about assimilating the Word. I'm going to do that isn't good enough. Yeah, I'm going to get around to doing that. I got around to doing it for about six months and never did do it. Once I decided I was going to do it. <laughs> I had to put a stake in the ground. I heard that today somewhere. I had to put a stake in the ground. I said, I am going. that's the day I got that spiral out, and I drew those lines. And I, the way I did it, now you can do it any way, you know, there's all kinds of ways. You can count the pages in your Bible in the New Testament, you know. So 
How long does that, how long, how many months? You're going to find out. It's going to take months for you to do this, even 30 times. It's going to take months. It took me about two and a half years. But I made up my mind. I was going to read so many pages. Some people do so many chapters uh, a day. And I didn't, did you make it every day? Of course not. But I, if I hadn't have set that goal, I probably still wouldn't be finished. But I got finished. It took me two and a half years. I haven't done it 50 times. I've done them 30 times. This little tool I'm going to give you is really, will really help you with that. Well, now here's the amazing things that began to happen. Like Luke 6, 38. We just got the revelation of what that really means, okay? What it really means is this. God says, when you extend my mercy, it doesn't matter what they do to you. They may steal your 50,000. They may treat you ugly. But if you, if you learn to have my heart and you pray for them and do good to them and and if they take the money, just let them go. My promise to you is I will speak to the hearts of other people. And they will give back to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. The real promise is if you'll extend his love to the sinner, and how much more would it apply to your brethren? If you extend his love, you'll never be permanently diminished. <laughs> that sinner may walk off with your money. God says, I'll get it back to you. The answer to Paul's, now see, that's in Luke. Paul's question later on, why don't you rather just be defrauded? And it dawned on me one day by assimilation. I had both the books in me 30 times. I said, well, the reason that we, the reason we're not willing to be defrauded is we don't believe Luke 638. That's what it is. We just don't believe it. We, we don't, most of us have never even been, most of the church, are you kidding? They've never been taught that, what that really means. But if, if God really becomes your source, this whole thing works by what? How, what, did, what did Jeremiah say? Blessed is he that trusts in the Lord. If, he be, if, you, if you believe what he said in Luke 6, 38, you're not worried when that guy, you let him go. Okay, okay, you can go. I'm going to extend mercy to you. I'm going to let you go. I could take you to court. I could take you to court. Probably would have a few years ago. <laughs> Jesus, though, he had mercy on me and forgave me all my sins. I'm going to extend that same mercy to you. Forgive you too. Let you go. Same thing that Jesus said when dealing with a brother that needs to be restored. Now he said we could go to that passage too. He says now first if 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 he if there's offense if he's offended you you know and Dave says he's run maybe it's a brother now that ran off with your fifty thousand. Well first you go to him alone and you discuss it and if you can get him to agree you've gained your brother. But if not take two or three witnesses with you rehearse the whole thing again. If he says go jump in the lake again. Then you take it before the church, and, and if he won't hear the church, finally, bless God, let him be as a heathen and a publican unto you. Dave says, boy, I was glad to hear that man. He finally, I can sue this guy's britches off. He'd treat him like a heathen and a publican. And then one day, Luke 6, 38 went off on the inside of him. Oh, my God, how are we supposed to treat the heathens and the publicans? Do good to them. Pray for them. If they take away thy goods, don't require them again. <laughs> He said, oh, my God, I'm to, I'm to loose him and let him go. Like that king in the parable where Jesus explained it says, the guy that owed, owed him that money says, no, he says, loose him and let him go. I forgive him all of his debts. It's the heart of God. So how do you become a tree planted by the river of water? Well, you've got to really become a person that trusts in the Lord. Well, how do you become that person? You're going to have a hard time doing it without knowing his word. That's why I really recommend, like Pastor Dave Assimilation of the Word of God. Now, we, uh, let's see. There's more on that side. Daisy, could I get you to hand these out on this side? Would you pass these out over? On, let me keep one. Well, I don't need it. I don't know what it says. No, so I can hold it up for the screen here. What this is, and I'm going to make sure that this form is at my website. It'll be under the uh, Gary Carpenter GCM printed materials, I think, is the, the page. And the one I have is actually in color. I just printed these off in black and white so it would be quicker. So you can print more of these if you want on your own home computer. The same day that this lesson appears there, this form will appear there. For benefit of the camera, let me walk a little closer. Is that close? Is that about right? And all this really is is in the left-hand column we have all of the uh, listed, all of the books of the New Testament. Okay, uh, starting from Matthew all the way through Revelations. Now, I didn't really develop this form. I taught on this 
uh, in South Korea one year. And uh, I'll tell you, the South Koreans are the most diligent people that you'll ever find in your life. Now, they, did we, are we going to have enough? Who, who doesn't have any yet? Okay. We're going to might need to take, take and make some more. So anyway, I was teaching, here, just take this one. That's enough. I was teaching them. Uh, uh, okay. All right. <laughs> so I was telling them about doing it like 30 times. But these Koreans, of course, I said, you know, 50 times would be better. So guess what they put on here? 50 times. You know, if 50 is better, then they're going to do it 50 times. So that's just the, that's the typical Korean mindset. So uh, what you do, of course, is you just take the form. And you can use this. You can fold it and keep it in your Bible. You can use the hash marks, whatever works for you. But I thought this was pretty nice. I kind of like this form. We're going to make some more copies so everybody will get one. I didn't have enough faith. I didn't print enough copies. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> and of course what it means is every time you read one of the books you put an X put an X there you read it again you put an X there now, let me tell you something from experience don't just start sequentially Matthew, Mark, Luke and John uh, the same stories are repeated over and over again plus those are fairly large books and uh, you're going to have to fight discouragement what I really recommend is you skip around a little bit I like starting with the book of John John was the first book that I assimilated, and I did it just 10 times. The first time, I did 10 times. I did all of the New Testament in 10. That's why we had these 10s across here. Do them all 10 times, then come back and do them another 10 times, then come back and do them all another 10 times. You're going to find that works for you a lot better. And skip around some. Do a big book like John. You say, boy, that took a while. Then do Jude. <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> really it, it, it helps something in you you know and then maybe take a medium book like maybe uh, Galatians you know or Ephesians one of those size books then in maybe the next book I will try Matthew or no uh, uh, yeah Matthew we did John first get a big book then go over and take Titus <laughs> and, but one at a time one at a time and skip around in there and, and that way it's, it's not repetitive but what you're actually doing, you're equipping your, yourself for day and night meditation. And you're going to start finding, you may have a hard, see, uh, Paul wrote letters to, his, his ministry was primarily to the Gentile. Okay? But yet, what's really, you know, God's got a sense of humor. Okay? Peter is a rugged, uneducated fisherman. Paul is the scholar of scholars. If anyone knew all of the ins and outs of the law, it's Paul. Human wisdom would say, well, now to the Jew, we're going to send Paul, and to the Gentiles, we're going to send the fishermen. What does God do? Nope. He sends Peter <laughs> to the Jews. Paul, he sends to the Gentiles. I love that. The gen, you know what the Jews needed? They need a slap of raw power. And that's exactly what Peter would give them. You, he'd come in and raise, them from the, raise this lady from the dead and two whole cities got saved. You know? Paul understood all of the types and shadows so well from the Old Testament. He could see how the, God's plan the whole time was to save the Jews, but it took to save the Gentiles. So he reluctantly got into his call. We'll get into that another time, but he did. Thank God for that. But now here's what you're going to find. Paul, boy, lion's clock. Well, uh, Paul, some, like Romans is really, uh, even though it's written, Rome was a Gentile place, but you can tell that book, he's really written a lot. He says, I write to those that understand the law. I write to those that know the law. So a big part of Romans is written to the Jewish mindset. Okay, and that's for everybody, but it's got a lot of Jewish mindset to it. Both of his letter to the Corinthians, trust me, <laughs> these, that's, a, that's a naval town, that's, sailors are there, this is a rough place, Corinth was known as a real rough and tumble place. These are Gentiles that wouldn't know the law if Moses came in carrying a scroll. He, you know, I mean, they don't know anything. And yet Paul would teach the same truths, truth is truth, but how he would present that to the Gentile mindset. And how he would present that same truth to the Jewish mindset was completely different. And I find that very often, 
Maybe I'm having a tough time in Romans. But by assimilating all of the books, it, 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 it happens automatically. You don't have to make it work. It just does work. You assimilate all these. You equip yourself for day and, day and night meditation. And just like that one there, one day I'm going through there just doing my own business. And Why don't you rather just be defrauded? And instantly I knew. I said, well, it's Luke 638. Nobody, nobody believes it. And the reason they don't believe it, nobody teaches it correctly. That's why we don't do it. But if you do do it, you know what will happen. And have faith in that verse. Now somebody that asked me the other day says, well, does it work automatically without faith? I said, does anything in the word of God? It requires faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. It doesn't work automatically. Hmm. Hallelujah. So we're passing out. If you need, if you need one of these forms, raise your hand. Let Daisy see you. We got some more of them here. And uh, we'll pass them out. But I, feel free to jump around in here. I do recommend that you fill up the first ten columns all the way. I don't care what sequence you read the books in, but assimilate them all ten times. Then start that next bunch. Assimilate them ten times again. Ten times again. Is this a requirement? No. Do you have to have any of this to go to heaven? No. If the thief on the cross made it, honey, the blood is enough. You hear me? God's not trying to keep people out of heaven. He's trying to get people into heaven. This is not a requirement in any sense of the word. We're not putting you under law. This is a tool for the hungry. I find it to be quite effective. Now, I can say from my own personal experience, this works. I mean, I, could, I just gave you one revelation. I could go, we could go on for another 30 to 45 minutes. I don't know how long. Revelation after revelation where suddenly one book, something will jump out at you in, in Titus. And you go, oh, my God. Well, if that's true, then this must mean this over here. And you go over, and sure enough, one book will help unlock a mystery in another book. And see, by doing it this way, you are automatically, automatically meditating all of it in context. Do you understand what I'm saying? You say, well, I'm not sure where that, you know, I asked the Holy Spirit to help me. And I'm not sure where this subject begins and where it ends. <laughs> yes, ma'am. But, <laughs> but by doing it this way, automatically you're getting them all in context because you're reading them all. You're not lifting any verses out of their setting. I mean, you're giving the Holy Spirit, I, I don't want to phrase, I feel like saying the best chance, that's not, that's not good enough with him. You, you, by cooperating with the Holy Spirit, you're greatly accelerating your growth. How, how much revelation knowledge he can pour into you. And it's more than revelation knowledge anymore. I'm finding... Uh, revelation knowledge is a part of it. What comes through that root into your tree is more than knowledge. It is his heart. It is Christ in you, if you'll allow me. Your value systems change. Yes, sir. Let me understand. John G. Lake was a very wealthy man. He was a millionaire by the standards in that day, back in the, around the turn of the century, a little later. How much would that be? He'd be a billionaire today, no doubt. And he, uh, he, he so, uh, the, the God so captured him and the, the, the healing power of God that he left everything, gave it all away, gave away his lands, gave away all of his possessions, got on a boat, him and his wife and their children, and sailed with hardly anything in their pocket. I don't even know if they had a dollar. I don't know. All the way to Africa. Got off the boat and there was a lady there that met him. And uh, I, I may have the wording a little bit off. But in essence, she says, are, are, you, are, you, are you a preacher? Yeah. Are those your children? Yeah. I have a house for you. God showed me that a man, a preacher was coming with his wife and that many kids. <laughs> he told me to provide a house for you. Now, when are we going to become people like that? See? You know, my age now, I don't have decades to play around. I don't have time to patty cake. If assimilating the word will accelerate the, the uh, ability of the Holy Spirit to grow me up quicker and mature me quicker like Michael was teaching today, and I, I'm telling you, I know it does, then let's get on with it. This is a message for the hungry. No, you're not required to do this. Are you hungry? 
You want to know him? You want to trust in the Lord? How do you get trust like that? See, it's blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord. You know, Smith, Smith Wigglesworth and John G. Lake, men like that are, I want to, I'm, let's press towards that mark. And let's really press beyond there. Let's just press towards Jesus, who is the Word. Let's press towards that. I highly recommend this to you. If I find them in the trash as I go out, I'm not disappointed. It's okay. If just one or two of you gets this. If you become the next John G. Lake or Mrs. John G. Lake. <laughs> Mr. or Miss Smith Wigglesworth, glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. Does anyone not does you have any questions about this before we start doing the confessions? Any questions? Is it pretty self-explanatory? Yes, sir. That's the way I did it. You wouldn't have to. He's asking, he says, you know, like if you start at the book of John, do you read the book of John ten times in a row? Or do, can you just read it once and mar mark it and then go to another book? You can do it either way. But the idea is read all of them ten times. Either way, whatever works for you, there's no law to it. The way I did it, I read John ten times. That's, that's why I moved the beam. <laughs> okay. But you, 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 don't, you don't have to. You don't have to. Uh, anyway, it will work. But what I'd like to see, I think what works best now, after I, you know, having done this a while, meditate them all ten times. Then meditate them all ten more times. I don't care if you do it three John twice, five, ten times, and then move on. However you do it is fine. But get all of them in you ten times. Then get all of them in you ten times again. Got it? Any other questions? That's a real good question. Yes, sir. Why that work for Eason and Eason? Um, the question is, what about listening to it? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't do it that way. It might work just the same. I honestly don't know. It might be fine. It might be fine. Um, it doesn't say you have to read the Word. It says meditate in the Word. See, so it may, that may be fine if you want to. Uh, I don't know. I guess that'd be okay. You know, if you've got it. Uh, I know a lot of people now have iPods or iPhones, and they've got, uh, you know, the Bible in audio format. I, I suppose that would work. Uh, the only thing with me now when reading requires more of my mind than listening. Very often I'm listening and I ain't there. <laughs> to be honest with you, I go somewhere else. I know reading it works. Hearing it may work. <laughs> Somebody can let me know. But I, I, I would be afraid that my mind would drift too often. But... Uh, Hey, you know what? You'll still be better off, though. You'll, you'll just, even if you did it that way, even if you did it any it's going to, you're going to be better off than if you never tried it at all. Amen? Any other questions? Those are both real good questions. Yes, sir. Uh, this is more of a comment, but can I share my technique? Sure. Come on up. You, you can't do it from there. He can't hear you. I should have brought state, it. State your name for the people. My name is Douglas Lee. Hope you can hold this yourself. Thank okay. you. Okay. <laughs> um, I should have brought this myself, but I have um, a folder at home, and um, I've got several things in it. I do have some confessions in it, and um, but also whenever I go to assimilate, what I've done, I've taken the the text, you know, from each book in the New Testament. And I went through and removed all the chapter headings. And I stayed with the pretty much the, the sentence structure that was there and you know just took it from uh, from the uh, the eSword um, Bible software, just transferred the text into a word processor and mainly I just have the text. I don't have the chapter headings, don't have the verse markings. I'm just reading the text because I found that when I was reading, you know, in a regular Bible with the, the text and, chapter. Uh, you know, the chapter headings and the verse markings, they were getting in my way. And I just read that, and it goes a lot quicker. And actually, my practice was to read each book once a day. And that way, in a month, I'm through with the book. Now, that is kind of extreme. And if you've got the time, I would suggest doing that. 
um, but not everybody can. And there were some times when I couldn't finish a book in one day, um, but I would finish it the best I could. And of course, there are some books, um, you know, like Jude and, and Philemon and some of the others. You could probably read those two or three times a day, and it'd be done within done with them in a couple of weeks. Also, um, books that are grouped together, uh, like First, Second Corinthians, I tried to read them together. Uh, First, Second Thessalonians, I read them together because they do go together; they are related, and it um, it makes a difference. It sure does. Well, those are good ideas, and really, to be honest with you, one of the things you're going to find happening as you do this, now that would, that would speed up the process, you're going to get delivered from chapter divisions, because you're going to find out those are not anointed, they were done by well-intended men that did the best they knew how, and, and uh, mo- many of them are fine, but boy, sometimes they'll just put a chapter ahead, and you go, how in the world could, because the thought just continues right on, you know, so that's, uh, you know, that, that's real good information there. All right. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Yes, ma'am. Okay. She's saying at Alexander Scorby, where do you buy that at? Oh, it's on the internet for free? How, is that, where do you go to find that? Where is it? firefighters.org you might check that out or you could just google Alexander Scorby and maybe it'll come up that way you know but he doesn't put in the chapter headings is what she's saying there well praise God for that well anyhow this is a a sim- we highly recommend assimilating the word of God it's not required but if you want to give a put a booster rocket on your on your growth I, I don't I'll tell you it, next to praying in other tongues it's probably the best thing that that I've learned from Pastor Dave. It accelerated my understanding of the New Covenant, and it's still doing it. That's why I feel the need to do it again. I've done them all 30 times, and I'm getting, I'm just right at, oh, I know what I was going to say. I I kept counting the books. I thought there was 26 or 27, 27, right, in the New Testament. So if you do one one a month, how many months is that? Let's see now. 27 months. That's still over two years. Am I doing that right? That's what I'm saying now. It, it is not going to happen without that stake in the ground. <laughs> You're going to have to make a decision, come up with some system. Some people count the pages, read so many pages a day. Some people do a book a day. And, of course, some days, you, you know, uh, on an average. Some people do uh, uh, chapters, just so many chapters a day. Whatever works for you, but come up with a plan. Otherwise... Ten years from now, you'll still be going, yeah, one of these days I'm going to assimilate the word. No, that ain't going to happen. 